I'm David Torsibia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse in the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Another chat show, David. Yep, and uh, we got a lot to talk about once again this week, and uh, one of the favorite things that I personally get out of this show, Daniel, is when listeners write us and tell us stories, whether it's something that happened to them in their actual life or thoughts they had, questions, Uh, and we got a lot of these emails recently, but one in particular I think uh, I wanted to take a moment to share. All right, David. So let me share a little bit of this email from you, Daniel. This was written to us by a listener named Lawrence. I'm not going to give you all his backstory and his personal information in here, but he did write us uh, with a couple comments, but one of them that stood out to me was uh, his experience of his own bullshit job. And uh, he was just recently listening to our episode on bullshit jobs, number 63, Busy Work, and uh, he realized, wait, all of this sounds really familiar and I have my own personal experiences in this field. So uh, let me please share this with y'all so that you can share it with everyone else who's listening and know that they aren't alone out there with their own bullshit experiences or something. Unfortunately, a lot of us have to deal with. So uh, I, I want to just read some excerpts from this. This is not the entire story, but um, the good bits. So if you'll bear with me for a second here, Daniel. Uh, yes, the infamous and now ubiquitous. Bullshit job story, David. These are always fun um, because we love pain, right? We love knowing that we're not alone in our pain. And so many of us do have to work bullshit jobs. I think maybe you and me are a little bit of the lucky ones, you know, here on the microphone. Oh, definitely lucky, Daniel, without a doubt. But it's always uh, interesting to hear these stories because they're also so diverse. You know, I think everybody can relate to the idea of doing pointless work. But there's infinite variations of what bullshit jobs really look like. And I think Lawrence's story is, is pretty interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, so let me go ahead and share some of the story. And I'm not going to read all this verbatim. Um, I will towards the middle, but I want to just sort of summarize his situation to begin with. So uh, Lawrence was something called an activities coordinator in a small office called the Community Partnerships Office that was part of a university Okay, uh, up in, in Canada. Lawrence wrote us and told us that he was making about 40000 Canadian a year and uh, was put in charge of a fund of almost 150000 Canadian every year. Is it Canadian dollars? Canadian dollars, yeah. Not Canadian people. Canadian dollars. Um, and, and so uh, this, this uh, fund was supposed to connect local high school students and encourage those students to come to this college that he worked at, right? So he's basically a college recruiter using this money to try and, and do it in interesting ways that piques the student's interest and, and gives them value to come to whatever college he worked at. So, I mean, right off the bat, your uh, bullshit jobs, alarm bells might start ringing a little, but... Well, well, his bullshit alarms were going off, David, when he realized that uh, his work was actually duplicating the work of others at the college. He writes, quote, problem was there already existed a robust recruitment arm of the college. And Graeber talks about the bullshittery of their jobs, too. So my role was duplicating their work, as several high schools told me. Yeah, and duplication is one of those key elements of what creates a bullshit job. And and, it exists as this sort of uh, system that has to constantly make itself justified in the eyes of whoever's controlling these budgets and these amounts of money. And that's one of the problems that Lawrence ran into, where he had this budget, $150,000 a year, and he had to make sure that he spent all of it in order to guarantee that his department would get the money again next year. And if they didn't spend all of it, then they'd be, well, you obviously don't need this much money. Let's reduce the amount you get to. One of those classic problems where you have to spend the budget, even if you don't need it all, in order to keep uh, the next budget coming in. Well, what was he spending this money on? Well, uh, that's a good question. So uh, he had to do all sorts of things. Uh, again, what's I said? So he's responsible for inviting high school students to the college to do tours and workshops. And generally, he writes that he would be allocated like 10 to $15 for one high school student per visit. And uh, I mean, no matter how fancy the food that they're giving at the colleges and how much swag they gave away, they actually already ran into trouble 
getting all this money to the students. You can't give them the money directly, but you know, in, in terms of the swag and things that they would receive. And that has a problem. So how do we spend all this extra money so we don't get our budget cut down? So to expand beyond this, they started trying to look for specific programs that they could outreach to the high school students in order to increase the budget that's happening here and uh, guarantee that the funding is going to continue to come in. And so he wrote us about one of these specific examples, and I'm just going to read this verbatim um, because I think it's really interesting. So you ready? I'm ready. One specific project was allocated about $20,000 and involved bringing high school students to do a design exploration of something that would help their school. It happened to be a school that had experienced multiple stabbings and was generally in need of positive things. This class of 20 came twice and spent full days brainstorming until they designed a mobile drink cart for their football team. Great. So off they go back to school with a check to buy materials and I put it out of mind for a few months while they built away and I focused on other things. More on that later. And after a while, and being unable to get in touch with the main teacher, I just went to the school myself and tracked him down. To my utter shock, walking into the class, I found not a mobile drink stand for the benefit of the entire school, but an actual fucking go-kart. They had decided that the drinks were boring, granted, and decided that this was more fun. I agreed, but my role was to write a goddamn report to the Ministry of Education, and fuck knows how I'd spin this one. I spoke to my boss, and she basically said, spin it so it looks good. At the end of the funding cycle, I stressed over the reports and budget for a week, and finally had a story worthy of Alexander Dumas. However, when it came to submit them using the online ministry portal, there was only space to input budget. No written reports at all. I asked my boss, who then investigated this and said that written reports were to be internally assessed by said boss and only flagged up if there were anomalies. So as long as I spent all the money and my boss, whose job, by the way, was also of the BS variety, agreed it was well spent, then... We were on track to receive another $150,000, maybe more, the following year. I had 15 projects in total, some as easy as little research initiatives, others the go-kart experience, but all of which took about 15 to 20 hours per week. The rest of the time, I twiddled my thumbs, took ridiculously long lunches, or just plain left. I knew to always carry a notebook or clipboard with me on my time-wasting adventures, as if I was on the way to or from a meeting and was never questioned by my boss. The remaining time at the job, I actually poured into environmental activism. I was involved at the time with the Zeitgeist movement and planned Toronto Z Day right from the college. After 18 months of bullshittery, I could no longer take it, driven mad by the idea that I was 24 and being paid to do fuck all while so full of energy and potential, I quit, sold everything, got rid of my apartment, and went organic farming around Ontario, hitchhiked to Vancouver, and fell in love. And and then he moved on and. and now his life is uh, very dramatically different than it was at this time. Um, I want I want to talk about this just for a second here, Daniel. That's the end of his story, and he goes on a little bit more to explain what he's up to at the moment. But I don't want to give too much information away. But suffice to say, a lot of people would look at this sort of job when you're you're fresh out of college, you're in a new place, as awesome. You get to do fifteen to twenty hours of work a week. You get to do whatever you want with the rest of the time, and you're making you know okay money. Uh, but it drives people crazy. And that's one of these unifying things about these bullshit jobs is a lot of times they're pretty easy, but it drives people insane until they can't take it anymore. They have to leave and move on or they just get beaten down and, and turn into a burnt out husk of who they were before. And luckily in Lawrence's case, he was able to channel this extra time into something productive, something he cared about that paved the way to the experiences and, and interests that he would follow in life that found him love and found his current career. Uh, after he left Canada and moved to Europe, where he works trying to help the environment. So uh, congratulations to you, Lawrence. I think your story is an inspiration. It, it's something that a, a lot of our listeners write us with very similar paths. And especially this week, we've gotten a lot of emails from people saying, I was doing something. I thought it was bullshit. I tried another thing. It also felt like bullshit. And then I just quit everything, moved across the country and became a farmer or joined an NGO or became uh, some sort of activist. And I, I guess that's also something that you're in the midst of right now, Daniel. Yeah, that's right. I'm here in Massachusetts, uh, about to start my new orientation for uh, working with a nonprofit, uh, again, that's going to be working on designing and implementing a food distribution model. You know what's interesting, David? I was uh, visiting a gym in the local area here, and I signed up, 
And as I was signing up, the owner of the gym, you know, was asking me about what I was doing. And so I told him, you know, I was involved with this nonprofit, going to be doing this work, distributing food to a, a much needed community that, that kind of lives in a food desert. And he said something interesting. He paused, like he didn't know what to say. And then he said, uh, oh, that's cool. You know, you're giving back to the community. And something about that didn't sit right with me. The words giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes me back to that episode we did, episode 61, Owning Change, about philanthropy and how the idea of giving back to your community kind of comes from this narrative of individual success. Like we as individuals, it's our job to go out into the world, make as much money as possible, become successful, grow our networks, build a business. And then once we have amassed this success and this wealth, Hey, you know, give back to the community that you came from. Give back to those that kind of helped you along your way, you know? And then you're kind of seen as this philanthropic capitalist who <laughs> is using their wealth for good. And I mean, I know this guy wasn't like trying to say anything negative. He was just trying to be supportive, but didn't really know what else to say. And well, not to interrupt you quickly, but I think that not knowing what else to say thing is important there because people are so disconnected from the communities and the idea of, of, of what a community is and how, and how you exist in one that that's the, the kind of programmatic automatic response people have because it's the only way they know how to relate it because it's something that they've been told to say just like you know when someone dies you say oh, i'm so sorry for your loss oh you're giving back to the community it's just an automatic response because that's that's the only way people know how to interact with these things because they don't have any personal experience in that situation where they can say something valuable or interesting yeah but a larger issue that it kind of brought to my attention is just the way our society conceptualizes work that benefits other people. Because the work I see myself doing, you know, building food distribution models, uh, encouraging people to adopt sustainable farming, gardening, these types of things, I don't see that as giving back to the community. I see it as a very necessary step towards a world that, that's not going to fall apart. You know, it's kind of like if you lived in a building that was supported by a, a couple columns, right? And uh, every 10 years you had to replace those columns or else the building would collapse. You wouldn't refer to the, the, the people who did that construction work as, oh, they're giving back to the community. No, you'd say this is a necessary job that if we don't do this job, our whole world is going to collapse. And, and that's how I see this work. It's, it's not a charity. It's, hey, if we don't do this, if we don't get on this path, if we don't implement systems that are going to be resilient in the face of climate change, we're not going to make it, right? This is necessary work. And, and we need as many people on board with these ideas as possible. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and there's a lot of people who are driven by that sort of idea that it's not about serving the community, but it's about being part of the community, putting that community first, and the work you do in it is just something that is expected, necessary, and vital to the continuance of not only the community, which is apparently the hot word of this episode, but also the larger uh, environment, uh, our culture, whatever. Beyond that, and and so maybe maybe this is a good transition to uh, we talked to some uh, activists who also feel driven by uh, this. Drive driven by a drive. Can you be driven by a drive, Daniel? Is there a better way to say that? <laughs> you can be a uh, backseat driver of uh, motivation to to do good things. Backseat driver of motivation. I don't think. Well, people who just feel it's necessary to be part of this system, pushing things forward uh, in the only way they know how, and especially whenever possible, making sure. I, I guess here your backseat driver uh, is. Well, maybe it's not. Backseat driver is a bad thing, right? When somebody's telling the person in the front what to do, even though they're driving. Well, uh, a lot of these activists are making sure that, yes, they're driving things forward, but when necessary, they take a step back and let the people who really are the leaders of these communities, local communities, take the, the step forward and making sure they're just giving them the tools and the organization and the drive to continue pushing, but understanding that the local population already has a lot of ties with each other. And you need to respect those anytime you are doing organizing or volunteering or anything like that, which is something for you to keep in mind too, Daniel, as you come into all sorts of communities that have existed for ages at this point. Yeah, well, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the work I'm doing. Building out a food hub is essentially what, what this job is. And the first year of what we're going to be doing 
is just really meeting with the community, forming groups of community members to help guide and steer us in the right direction. And that's in contrast to other approaches some people have, which is like, hey, let me think up a, a, a solution that no one's asked for and then go into a community and impose it, right? This is the exact opposite approach to that, which is something I'm fully on board with. And you're absolutely right that that's the appropriate approach when helping other people and helping communities is first find out what the need is and figure out how you can help them achieve their goals and how you can connect those efforts to the struggles of other people wherever they are. So you're right. We talked to a couple activists who are involved with Earth Strike, and Earth Strike is just one of many international efforts to combat climate change and build solidarity across uh, several communities around the world. And they have some international demands, which we'll read. But what's really interesting to me is Earth Strike actually came out of a desperate comment that someone made online. It was actually in, not a comment, but just a post in the Chomsky subreddit of all places on Reddit. And I remember seeing it at the time and uh, it got thousands of upvotes. And it was just somebody basically so traumatized by all the things that are happening in this world, driven to the end of their wits saying, well, it's time to do something. And they just, they just happen to set a date and everyone is like, okay. Yeah. Let me read that right now. The title of this post is General Strike to Save the Planet. I don't fucking know how to do this. I'm one of these distant types that never reacts to anything. I'm scared out of my mind. The planet has what? Maybe two years before it's game over? I heard we have 10 years a while ago, but it seems like every week we see a new headline saying it's worse than we thought and faster than we expected. Until six days ago, I didn't vote. I saw a rigged system that was bought and paid for and thought electoral politics was an insult to one's intelligence. Others have different opinions on the importance of voting, but one thing can be very clear. Voting in our system will never be enough. We, the royal collective we, need to disrupt the system, and there will never be a convenient time. The number of days we have left is dwindling. Working date is January 15th. I originally thought the first for symbolic reasons, but a large portion of workers are off anyway that day. We need disruption, civil disobedience. It has to start somewhere. Likely it won't be with this. I just want to get a ball, any ball, some godforsaken shot in the dark, I don't want to die ball rolling. And that post was made in November 10th of last year, 2018. And uh, I remember seeing it at the time. It popped up and uh, I gave it an upvote. There were lots of uh, comments in there. And you'll notice that original date there, January 15th, 2019. Well, that's, that's come and gone. And uh, there were a lot of experienced organizers who did pop up in these comments and say, this is awesome. This is great. But well, there's no way we can organize a general strike in three months, uh, two months, really. So uh, let's take this energy and let's keep pushing it forward. And uh, it, was, it was incredible watching it come together over the, the next week. Uh, almost immediately, there were websites put up, Discord communities grown, uh, all sorts of people from around the world with media design capabilities, with uh, advertising knowledge, all came together very organically, very quickly, set up chapters around the world, and, and, and this thing kicked off. And there's something here that, that I want to point out is that you know, a lot of times when we're talking doom and gloom in terms of the climate, especially right now as the rainforest burns, I've seen a lot of people casually talk about this online, uh, a lot of people in real life, people who normally don't talk about this sort of climate stuff. Uh, when this, th there's a criticism in the larger status quo community that says alarmism doesn't work, that when you tell people that things are really in dire straits, that they give up. Uh, but this, this post right here, and the actions I've seen people take in the recent days seem to me to tell exactly the opposite story. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like people who are trying to defend the status quo are just doing that, trying to defend business as usual. I mean, this is somebody who says they have no hope, they're scared out of their mind, but instead of just giving up, they made this post that happened to kick off what is coming up to be, hopefully, probably one of the largest climate-related events in history. Uh, with people all around the world organizing for a single day after a week of, of events leading up to this of climate resistance. And that wouldn't have happened if this person wasn't alarmed and terrified to the point that they felt that it became a 
matter of life and death to do something. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the opposite of what the media and the status quo try and tell us to do, uh, what, what people caution organizations like the IPCC to do, which is, hey, you know what? Alarmism does work a lot of times because if people aren't scared, if they don't realize the stakes, then why would they make these sacrifices or take these risks in order to make a change? Right. And that day that you're referring to is scheduled for September 27th. In some countries, it may be September 20th. And there are three international demands coming from from this international movement, and I'll read those right now. An immediate start on global cooperation to reverse the damage done to the Earth's climate through unambiguous and binding agreements by both world leaders and corporate entities following IPCC projections of cutting carbon net emissions in half by 2030 and zero net emissions by 2050. Second, international unambiguous and binding commitments to halt the destruction of rainforests and other wildlife habitats. Finally, international unambiguous and binding agreements designed to hold corporations accountable for the greenhouse gases they produce. Now, of course, that's just the international demands. Every single country, every single region will have their own set of demands on Earth Strike Day and leading up to it. And so we heard from two organizers, one here in the United States, in New York City, and one in the UK, each offering their own unique perspective on the work that needs to be done and how we can all be involved. Let's give a listen to Jacob from New York City with Earthstrike NYC. Hello. So we're here with Jacob, an activist and organizer with Earthstrike New York City. Jacob. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, so how'd you get involved with Earthstrike and what's going on in New York? Well, I got involved with Earthstrike back in March. I don't even remember how, but I believe through a uh, local, like I reached out to anarchist ecological organizers in the city and they put me in touch with Earthstrike. Um, and I've been like in it pretty hard ever since. And what's happening in New York is September 27th, we're planning a community strike for climate over colonialism. So New York is obviously where the big UN climate summit is happening. There's a week of actions by a lot of different groups happening during that week while the UN is here. Our event is the last event of that week. And I think what makes our action something that a lot of people are getting excited about is that it's really rooted in frontline radical work that all the different communities in New York are doing. So, you know, obviously the UN is in, in Manhattan, in Midtown. Our strike is not in Midtown. Our strike is in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, because that's a community where Puerto Rican organizers and Asian American organizers and low income organizers have been working for decades on the intersections of climate destruction, climate injustice, gentrification, and capitalism, basically. And we see our strike, our like rally and then march as making that community, Sunset Park, like the epicenter of the broader fight for climate liberation. So what is this strike going to look like? It's going to be a rally of all these different communities coming together. Uh, we're encouraging people to take the full day off of work. But as I said, like because we're being very rooted in marginalized communities, really, a lot of whom, most of them are not unionized, a lot of whom have greater difficulties, certainly than I do, as a white, just set man uh, in striking. We're starting our main rally at three o'clock, which means that if people can only take a half day off of work, because this is kind of our first big action, they should still feel powerful in showing up. Uh, so the rally is going to start at three in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. We're going to have a lot of different kinds of, I don't want to say speakers, like things like teach-ins and art performances, new performances, et cetera. So we're going to have main speakers from these different organizing communities starting around five. And then thereafter, we're probably going to be marching and that route is not confirmed yet. What are you hoping to get out of this strike? Yeah, we're hoping to show the world that these communities are already powerful and the, that basically the solutions are already here. I think that's kind of a phrase that like scientists will say a lot, that we have the solutions. But I think what we're trying to show is that we have the political solution. Organizations like Uprose, which is our main partner who 
like I said, has been doing this work in these working class communities of colors, communities of color for decades. They've already been doing the work. And people like the Puerto Rican organizers who organized the big Ricky Renuncia actions, the solidarity actions with Puerto Rico a few weeks ago that basically got the governor of Puerto Rico to step down. They're already doing the work and they already have the solution. So we're hoping to lend power to them and then in so doing, build towards what people really think of as a general strike, which is where everybody in a city goes on strike at once to shut down these broader systems of colonialism and capitalism, which are destroying the planet. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, we're hearing from an Earth Strike organizer from the UK. Now, is there like a national Earth Strike organization that you're part of? Or, or how do you fit into the, you know, I guess, global movement to combat climate change and, and raise awareness for how our economic system plays into that? Totally. I think there's a couple answers to that. So the first answer is that I'm with Earth Strike New York City. Um, Earth Strike New York is an autonomous member of the International Earth Strike Collective. That's kind of like the organizational answer, I guess. But then in terms of, I think, your broader question of how does this fit in to kind of like these interlocking systems of, uh, I think, the economic system, that's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about. And New York City is a really maybe unique and powerful place in that is because we have people here from all kinds of diaspora communities. Uh, For example, tomorrow in New York, some of our partners are putting on a huge action against Bolsonaro. There's, these are people from the Brazilian diaspora who are anti-fascist against what Bolsonaro has been doing to destroy the Amazon. Uh, like I've already mentioned, there are Puerto Rican organizers here. So we see New York as this opportunity. We have people from all these different communities in the same place. And if they are all talking to each other about how colonialism is wrecking the planet and how global capitalism is, wreck- is, is wrecking the planet, that could be a really powerful thing. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. So how does someone get involved in this if they're not in New York City? That's an awesome question. So the answer right now is to, you know, I'm going to say what everybody says. Like us on Facebook, we're at Earthstrike New York City. They can also send us an email at earthstrikenyc at protonmail.com. We're on like all, we're on basically all the social media at Earthstrike NYC. Uh, we're also on Venmo if people want to get involved that way at Earthstrike NYC. Um, And we've been seeing a really awesome response from people not in New York, from people who are seeing what we're doing, are seeing the radical demands that we have that I'd like to just like list off in a second. That's resonating with them. What's resonating with them is that we're doing work that is radical, is led by and accountable to frontline communities and is rooted in the work that those communities are already doing. And that's kind of something that is not just something that applies to New York City. Um, and it's just all right. Can I say that we have like eight demands that I think might help people think about us? Give it to us. So like I said, the, the strike is called the Community Strike for Climate Over Colonialism. Underneath that, the demands that we have are end climate imperialism, reject eco-fascism, prison abolition, end gentrification, community ownership, intergenerational leadership, animal liberation, and climate reparation. And each one of those centers a distinct frontline community. And each one is about how these broader systems of colonialism and capitalism impact different communities in different ways. Jacob, you talked about uplifting these communities who are already doing the work and supporting communities who are are marginalized and and fighting back and giving them the support they need. What about yourself? How did you get involved in this and and what kind of lit the fire under your feet? Yeah, well, so that's a really interesting question. So the community that I'm part of is the Jewish community. Um, New York, I think, has a most Jewish people of any city in the world. A lot of the work that I had done before coming to Earthstrike, honestly, was anti-Israeli occupation work within the Jewish community. And at some point, it occurred to me that, like, while that work is great and I still definitely very much support it, what really, as you said, lit the fire under my feet was I wanted to do work that directly, I wanted to fight the forces that were threatening to destroy my own community. So for that reason, as in addition to Earthstrike, an organization that I'm involved with is called Outlive Them, which is a Jewish anti-fascist network in New York City and around the world. So Outlive Them was actually, I think, the first group to officially endorse Earthstrike. You maybe don't think of like a group of anti-fascist Jewish people as an environmental organization, but I think something that Earthstrike is doing that's really cool is we are bringing in these groups that maybe don't think about themselves as green groups, as environmental groups, because we link. So, for example, one of our, our, our second demand is reject eco-fascism. 
we are one of the organizations in New York, certainly, that is speaking the most loudly in those terms, that ecofascism is real, it's connected, it's kind of like a species of, you know, regular fascism. And for example, you had the Christchurch shooter uh, in New Zealand from March calling himself an ecofascist. Yes. And in El Paso, in Texas, a couple of weeks ago, the mass shooter there said something to the effect of, you know, I'm an environmentalist and... As an environmentalist, I think we need population control. Basically, I think we need Hispanics and all non-white people to die. Mm -hmm. So as a Jewish person uh, who's certainly aware of the ways in which fascism, you know, has been a thing that has served to seek to exterminate Jewish people, I see environmental manifestations of fascism, whether by like those crazy gunmen or by Bolsonaro in Brazil or by Trump in the U.S., as a thing that directly threatens my community. So I see the work that I do as a Jewish anti-fascist and the work that I do as a radical environmentalist as like being kind of the same thing. So what other organizations are you partnering with and, and that are supporting you? Yeah. So I'll say the, the most important one, as I said, is Uprose. They're like our hosts because they've been doing the work at Sunset Park, this community in Brooklyn, for decades. So they're kind of the number one. They've endorsed us. Um, I live them. Our Jewish anti fascist network has endorsed us. The Eco Socialists, which is the New York City environmental chapter of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, uh, has endorsed us. Rise and Resist, which is an organization that came about in the wake of Trump's election that's done a lot of work resisting Trumpism, has endorsed us. Oh, I'm going to forget a bunch, aren't I? Um, Bronx Climate Justice North has endorsed us. We, just a couple of days ago, I think, got an endorsement from our first union, the American Federation of Teachers local branch in New York City, which is awesome. And in addition to like four or more groups who have gone through the voting process to endorse us, there are a ton of people who organizes and organizations that we're working with around basically all of our demands, including, as I said, Brazilian anti-fascist, Puerto Rican independence fighters who have organized the governor of Puerto Rico to step down and a lot of other groups who I'm not thinking of right now. Well, that's pretty good when you have so many supporters that you can't remember them all off the top of your head, right? <laughs> yeah, and something that we're really, I mean, it, we've been very uh, deliberate, I think. Like, our strategy is not to, like, go out and try to get the organization of the largest group we can possibly find. You know what I mean? Like, we're not reaching out to XYZ, big, green, nonprofit, and saying, hey, endorse us. We're, like, spending basically all of our time going to local organizations and chapters of larger organizations that are led by frontline communities that will take a stand against colonialism and capitalism uh, and saying to them, like, you're the people that we want. Like, for example, a couple of days ago, I was on the phone with um, two people from the Palestinian youth movement who, I think people from organizations like that sometimes feel like the environment of the movement doesn't speak to them or doesn't speak with them. And by framing ourselves very explicitly as anti-colonialism, and we say that that is the problem. It's a way for us to be speaking with those groups and offering those groups like kind of the most important place, which is what we see ourselves as doing. That's great. Well, I mean, this work is so important and it's, I mean, we just reviewed the latest IPCC report last week and, you know, there's some problems. I mean, there's conflicts of interest when you have a big funded international organization, you know, there's limits to what they can endorse politically and economically. And That's it. right, we need we need people in coalitions across this world working grassroots on the ground, uh, making things happen. So thank you so much for the work you're doing in September 27th, right? September 27th, three o'clock, Sunset Park. Thanks so much, Jacob. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I just want to reemphasize something Jacob said, which was, you know, how important it is to empower communities who are already doing important work. And he said something like, you know, scientists will tell us we have solutions or we know what the solutions are, but these communities are the ones living it out. They have the political solutions. And it reminds me of something we talked about last week, reviewing the latest IPCC report, which is, it's very clear that the IPCC, this international UN body, fails to present any real political roots towards achieving the very standards that they lay out as necessary if we're going to actually survive on this planet. Um, and we talked about reasons why that is. Maybe the IPCC has its hands tied by the political and economic forces that ultimately control them. But it's a reminder that we shouldn't feel hopeless that, oh, the IPCC doesn't give us clear 
directions of how to combat corporations. It doesn't give us political solutions because there is no political will for the things they recommend. Oh no, what are we going to do? But Jacob is here saying, look, we have the solutions and these communities are showing us the path forward. You know, yes, we can let the IPCC inform us scientifically, but when it comes to actually creating change, those radicals who have to respond to the things destroying their communities, that's where we're going to find the solutions and that's who we need to support. Yeah, I, I think this is such an important point to pull away, not only just from this interview, but from the larger show and the conversations we have on here across just everything, pretty much. And that is, you know, climate change is a solved problem. We know how to fix this. Like, uh, we spend a lot of time writing big reports about how bad is it going to be? You know, what's going to go on? What can we? But these are all just reports that exist because people are trying to find the best way to uh, solve things without changing the status quo at all. But like, if we're talking about solutions to climate change, you know, it's very simple. Less carbon in the atmosphere. Wow. What, what a shocker. And uh, the problem is, is that our, our energy, our economy is so closely linked to, to carbon that all, all this solution is untenable to almost everybody. But like, we know how to do this. We have lots of different solutions, whether it, it ranges from degrowth, whether it re- ranges from eliminating carbon fuel sources, uh, more sustainable local uh, farming or land use practices, you know, all, all sorts of things. Uh, and it's just a matter of where's the political will for these things. And that is the big gap in the IPCC reports. We know, we know the situation. We know how bad it's going to be. We know the solutions, but where are the political solutions? And that's what doesn't exist. And it's supposed to be constructing things like the Paris Agreement, other things like that. But nobody follows through with those. They're non-binding. And it's against everybody's best interest politically, economically, the people who are creating and signing these treaties to actually follow through with any of it, you know? But at the same time, the communities that are most impacted by this, these local communities like Jacob is talking about, they have the political solutions because they have to in order for them to exist, basically, in order to survive in the face of this climate crisis that isn't necessarily even coming, but is already here for many of them. It's, it's a matter of life or death. And it's very simple at that stage because it is a matter of uh, having that political will to push these things forward. They're not in, in economically invested in order to defend the status quo, like the people who are ultimately, you know, humming and hawing, like, what do we do? What's going to happen? Uh, this is not a hopeless, solutionless scenario. Climate crisis is solved. It's just a lack of how do we solve the political question that the people who are in power, who hold all the levers over us, don't want to be part of this solution. And that's why people like Jacob... Uh, other grassroots activists who are trying to empower these communities who are the ultimate stakeholders in this larger system. Like economically, maybe that's not true that they're they're the ones who hold all the power, but in terms of what is, what is any power in the end, but, but people willing to do something, this is where we have to enable these people who are willing to do something in their own best interest. That isn't about exploiting or continuing our economic system that is dependent upon the exploitative nature of everything and making sure that, that everything is unsustainable in order to uh, concentrate wealth for a smaller and smaller group of people. No, we have to look at people who are actually the people and are willing to make sacrifices in order to fight to basically ensure their survival. And any mm-hmm. organization, any sort of movement, uh, in order to be successful and in order to be responsible in defending the people that it claims to be helping has to start in this sort of way about taking these local communities, putting them at the forefront, and just giving them the tools to push forward the things that they need in order to best serve themselves. Yeah, and I want to talk about a little bit later in this episode, some of the strategies that corporations use and employ to undermine these communities that have the political solutions. But before that, let's hear from Cosmo in the UK. So all you people across the pond, can know what's going on in your backyard. So we're here with Cosmo Cattell, a student activist and organizer in the UK. How are you, Cosmo? Thanks for joining us. Good. Good. So you're an organizer with Earthstrike, right? What's going on with Earthstrike right now? Um, so I uh, with Earthstrike in the UK. Um, Earthstrike kind of started online from Reddit, uh, kind of dispersed over the world, and we've ended up now several different countries trying to organize a general strike um, which is happening on two different dates now and uh, some countries is going to be the 20th in some it's going to be the 27th the whole kind of idea of doing kind of strike is to unite 
the environmental movement to the labor movement, really. Yeah, so, so what kind of changes is Earth Strike targeting or prioritizing? The main thing, really, is system change and a just transition for workers. So we don't get left behind when that system change happens, basically. So system change, like in the face of climate change, hey, we need radical restructuring of our economies. We need we need politicians to, to finally wake up and start dealing with this problem. But at the same time, we want the labor movement involved and we want workers to be at the forefront of that. Yeah, exactly. So, for instance, all the workers are all of these fossil fuel companies and most jobs involved in agriculture and things like that, they're all going to have to be radically changed. And if we don't sort that out now, it's going to be too late pretty soon. Again, they're the ones that are going to be losing out rather than the people who should be losing out, which are the people in charge of those companies. Right. Okay, so you said September 20th and September 27th are when most of the general strikes are happening. What is that going to look like? So again, it will vary by different countries. Um, it will follow, I think, a similar pattern to the youth strikes. So there will be demonstrations all over the country, in your local town, city, hopefully, if they're being organized. In the UK, I think we've got well over 100 already planned. Um, we're doing big demonstrations, we're doing walkouts um, from workplaces. So people are going to be walking out with their colleagues and walking into the centre of cities and joining the big demonstration where the youth strikers will be. Um, a whole host of different actions and things like that. Are you working with um, people from XR Rebellion? I know that started in, so, in London, right? That's a movement that has similar goals. So what's kind of happening is um, we're entering the state the phase of the movement of movements now, um, which is where we want all organizations, climate organizations, activist organizations, even more than that, even people who wouldn't normally be associated with activism, so like different communities and um, things like that. We need kind of everyone uh, to come together and join this. There's a European group called By 2020 We Rise Up. Uh, they don't have any specific agenda or like kind of aims of their own other than uniting already existing groups uh, and they're trying to coordinate different ways of action but everyone's coming together and so the first wave is going to be beginning on the 20th of September and then through that week there'll be a week of like smaller actions um, around the UN summit which is on the 23rd it's this big summit which is in New York actually and then there'll kind of be a short rest period and then on the 7th of October we'll begin the next rebellion and um, I'm not sure if you're the last one but that was just in the UK we kind of occupied London for two weeks yeah, yeah it was all over the news yeah it was awesome we really got through to them with that so the next one in London is going to be uh, three weeks long, starting on the 7th of October. This is also a global rebellion, so that this will be in over 60 countries worldwide. I might be on that. And this is all part of the first wave of actions, um, which will be continuing in 2020. And the idea is that sustained waves of actions with a lot of people um, is how you implement uh, so change most effectively. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do. That's great. Let's see if we can keep that momentum going. What got you personally involved yeah. in this work? Um, I would say I was always kind of conscious of the environment, but kind of uh, at the same time, I would never have thought that we would be facing societal collapse or anything like that. Um, I actually had a friend quite a few years ago who used mm -hmm. to tell me that there's no, like, don't have kids and stuff like that. I'm not going to make it. And I used to kind of laugh at him. Then um, slowly over last year, um, I think when the IPCC report came out, that was kind of the big kick. And then for a couple of months after that came out, I just got really heavily invested in like, researching and stuff uh, down the rabbit hole. And, yeah, then a uh, strike kind of came about and I just kept on researching and I kind of went through that phase of um, kind of grief and anxiety 
and they actually gave them capitalism has been really beneficial and helping to overcome that. Um, so yeah, I'm mm. to anyone who kind of understands what we're facing, that activism is probably the most helpful thing to deal with that um, as a coping thing. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, it's, you can't uh, look around at the state of, of climate change and the consequences we face without, you know, feelings of anxiety. Many people experience depression. I experienced that. And, you know, certainly if you're listening to this podcast, you know, you might get anxiety. But what you're saying is there's a way out and that's organizing and actually working towards a solution and towards positive change. Yeah, definitely. It really helps being um, being around other people who are on the same wavelength and who understand. Well, thanks so much for uh, keeping us updated, Cosmo. And best of luck on your work. Cheers. Thanks for having me. I think Cosmo said something important there, which is the need to link the environmental movement with other movements like the labor movement. You know, Cosmo referenced the fact that hey, well, if we get rid of fossil fuel companies and uh, industrial agriculture, well, that's a lot of workers who are going to be impacted. And we don't need to be leaving them behind when the ones responsible are really the CEOs and the executive managers. So how can we join forces with the labor movement? Because the issue is connected. And something Jacob said earlier, kind of in the same vein of this, is that many marginalized groups for a long time have not felt like the environmental movement stands with them. And so this is the time to undo a lot of that disconnection. We need to be forging bonds with people across many different sectors because we are all connected to the environmental issue. Again, Jacob was talking about how colonialism is embedded with climate change. And we talk about this in our IPCC report episodes where even the IPCC recognizes that if we don't treat indigenous people with protection, and listen to them, we're not going to be able to solve these problems. Everyone is going to be impacted by climate change. Fighting climate change will impact everyone. So if you're not bridging the gap between those who share your own experience and those who will be impacted across some border between you two, we're not going to have as much strength as we need to really tackle this problem. Well, as much as we spend fighting for these things, Daniel, there are, uh, um, unfortunately, moneyed interests who are out there trying to do the opposite, trying to disperse these movements, trying to uh, discredit these activists. And I think it's maybe worth taking just a moment to talk about some of these groups, some of these people, and uh, exactly their techniques in this process. So it's our favorite time, Daniel. A little bit of history. Are you ready for this? Throw the book at me. In 1982, Daniel, there was this PR firm called Pagan International, that wrote that to effectively defend against activists, corporations must plan to, quote, separate the fanatic activist leaders from the overwhelming majority of their followers, decent, concerned people who are willing to judge us on the basis of our openness and usefulness, end quote. So we'll call this the divide and conquer mentality. And this came from the company founders' military backgrounds in counterinsurgency. In fact, after leaving the army, Raphael Pagan, the creator of Pagan International, went to work as a consultant for multinational corporations trying to invest in developing countries. And he honed this anti-activist strategies by working with Nestle during their baby formula debacle in the 70s that likely resulted in the deaths of at least a million infants per year in developing countries. If we didn't need more reasons not to like uh, Nestle, uh, a million infants a year. That was a huge, huge scandal. Yeah. And if you haven't read about this uh, Nestle baby formula scandal, go look it up. Uh, it's, it's honestly shocking. And they've done a really incredible job covering up a lot of it because of people's work like Raphael Pagan uh, and other PR firms that have learned from this process. But Pagan's work dividing activist groups from one another and co-opting important institutions like the Methodist Church helped shield Nestle from a more severe boycott. That was currently ongoing with a lot of uh, churches and religious groups, as well as private uh, citizens groups, to uh, punish Nestle, more or less, for these crime against humanity that they did. And uh, he was able to convince the Methodist church, through some back and forth, through some negotiations with Nestle, that in fact, you know what, the boycott is not the best idea, and that Nestle had changed, so everything was good, uh, and uh, reversed the boycott, thus saving the reputation of Nestle. And for all of this work, he actually won public relations awards. 
And of course, once you have one major coup like this Nestle contract that, that Pagan took care of, other firms started knocking on his door. Beautiful, wonderful, ethical companies like Dow Chemicals, Chevron, or Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, the Shell one is especially interesting because it was uh, primarily over their uh, work in apartheid South Africa, and, and Pagan was able to uh, reverse people's perceptions about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, though, this uh, brilliant ad man uh, who was able to uh, just live without any sort of moral or ethical code, I guess, died. And his company was uh, unfortunately... Or fortunately, maybe I should say, closed its doors. But his legacy lived on. And there was a new firm called Mongoven, Bisco, and Duchin, who took on clients such as tobacco company Philip Morris and a handful of industrial agriculture firms. And this Duchin, he took Pagan's original strategies and created a three-step strategy for dismantling activists. And this came to be known as the Duchin Formula. And uh, for those of you who are uh, semi-aware of global uh, w affairs or were just paying attention to the WikiLeaks documents, this company, Mongoven, Bisco, and Duchin, still exists today under a new name that you may have heard before called Strat4. So, Daniel, why don't you, why don't you t take us through the, the Duchin formula and explain how you can dismantle activists? Yeah, it's, it's a formula still used today by PR firms um, who advise corporations on how to dismantle opposition to their activities. And it's, it's a pretty simple formula. It seeks to take activists, nonprofit organizations, and other groups and categorize them into four different types. You have radicals, idealists, realists, and opportunists. The three-step Duchin formula is then to first isolate the radicals and then cultivate the idealists and educate them into becoming realists. And then finally, co-opt the realists into agreeing with industry. Okay, now, so what are these four subtypes? So first, you have the radicals. These are the people who are the most threatening to corporations. They want systemic change. They are typically anti-corporate in their fight, and they want an end to the evil that they see. And radical kind of has a political connotation, and it's been framed a certain way in media, but these are usually people born out of a necessity to fight. It could be a rural farmer who is having his soil poisoned by a nearby chemical company, or it could be an indigenous community living in the rainforest while companies raise their land and set fire to their homes, or it could be like the, the Puerto Rican communities that Jacob was mentioning or other groups who are trying to defend their home. These people are the most likely to organize direct actions against companies, and they're not going to compromise. The next most threatening group to these corporations is the idealist. And these people, according to the PR strategy, have a moral or emotional reason for their position. They want what is right and what is just and fair. And according to Duchin himself, quote, idealists want a perfect world. Because of their intrinsic altruism, however, they have a vulnerable point. If they can be shown that their position is in opposition to an industry and cannot be ethically justified, they will change their position, end quote. And then finally, you have realists. And realists are able to, quote, live with trade-offs, willing to work within the system, not interested in radical change, pragmatic. The realist should always receive the highest priority in any strategy dealing with a public policy issue, end quote. Uh, of course, you do have the opportunist, those are just people who they'll side with whichever uh, entity gives them the most advantages, the force that is most powerful, and corporations can generally rely on them to support their cause. So those are the four subtypes. And, and it's important to know how corporations categorize these activists because, like I said, there's a very clear and direct strategy of divide and conquer where, again, from the corporate perspective, the most important thing is to isolate those radicals first and foremost, right? Those indigenous people having their forest burned down will just cut them off from communications or turn them into the bad guys so no one will listen or trust them because those are the ones that aren't going to compromise. It's important from the corporate perspective to separate them from anyone else. They, they don't want them to influence other people's perspectives. And once they've done that, the goal is to educate, quote unquote, the idealists. These are the people with the moral uh, compass, right? And try to, try to get them to see, you know, of course you want a better world, but look, we need to think more realistic and more pragmatic. 
If you're not willing to compromise, then you're not going to get any of your objectives solved and kind of push them into the realist perspective. And then once you have them in the realist category, well, it can be pretty simple to compromise with people, ultimately, so that um, no fundamental change to your business ever happens and you can continue business as usual. Well, let's talk about business as usual for a second, Daniel. And I think this is what really interested me in this this method and in this methodology, which was, uh, well, there was a large WikiLeaks dump and uh, some of these Strat4 materials came out. And in that material, uh, there was a PowerPoint presentation and we're going to link it on our website. Come check it out. This way you don't have to go to WikiLeaks if you don't want to for whatever reason. And so this PowerPoint presentation was from global security firm Stratfor. The, the rebranding of this company we mentioned earlier. And it was directed at a Canadian oil sands corporation called Suncor in 2010. Now, at the time, Suncor was facing heavy public outcry over its plans to expand oil sands extraction in Alberta and the surrounding region. Stratfor. Now, they were hired to consult them on a way to deal with this activist movement that had popped up. And so first, Stratfor identifies all the activist groups and categorizes them based on the framework that Daniel just mentioned. And so under the radicals group, they have the Indigenous Environmental Network, Oil Change International, and Rising Tide North America. There were some groups that sort of bridge multiple sections of these groups, and they have this really actually interesting Venn diagram that they've constructed that you can check this out. Uh, Greenpeace and Rainforest Action Network are some of these groups that straddle between radical and idealists. If you look at the idealists, again, to remember what this is, these are people who are sort of resistant to working in this system and believe that there are moral and ethical outcomes no matter what the situation is, and they're going to try and stick to that as much as possible. These are the people that Strat4 or these companies are trying to turn into realists. This is groups like Amnesty International, Communities for a Better Environment, Earthworks, Plain Justice, uh, the Sierra Club. And then there are a couple groups, once again, that span uh, this idealist category and the next category, which is realists. And uh, that's groups like environmental defense, forest ethics, and West Coast environmental law. And remember, these categories are being defined by Stratfor itself. Right. I'm sure none of these groups would <laughs> self-identify as realists, right? Like, no. Oh, we're willing to work within the system. This is more like an intelligence thing, right? Like Stratfor's coming to these corporations and say, okay, I know Sierra Club is acting, you know, like they don't want to compromise, but actually... We have some connections there and we realize, hey, we can actually push them more towards our agenda if we can just kind of give them some pragmatic options. Right. And that's, that's an important thing to, to remember. These aren't just arbitrary terms. These are defining how these groups are willing to interact with this social change that they're seeking. A realist really wants to stick within the status quo and believe that that's the only type of change that's possible. An idealist thinks that there is something greater possible, but is open to compromise um, and can be converted into a realist, and a radical is never going to compromise. They know their vision. They don't trust the corporations. They don't trust the government, and they want to stick to what it is that they believe in. And so they're much more difficult to manipulate than an idealist who's willing to compromise or a realist who believes that the only method of getting things done is compromise in the first place. Well, who does Stratfor identify as the realists in this uh, 2010 presentation? So in this 2010 presentation are actually some very popular charities that are beloved. And especially right now, people are like, donate to these groups to protect the rainforest or, or whatever. Uh, this is groups like the National Wildlife Federation, the World Wildlife Fund, and the Natural Resources Defense Council. And I, th I think the National Wildlife Federation, did they come up on the show before, Daniel, as the people who license some land off to be... Uh, no, you're thinking of the Nature Conservancy. Oh, that's Nature Conservancy. Well, Nature Conservancy is definitely realist. <laughs> yeah, at least when it comes to uh, uh, endangered chickens. Yeah, that, that, that's episode 71, the big mean corporate machine with the Atwater Prairie Chicken. Well, either way, the presentation goes on to say, this is what these groups are going to do. They're going to create a campaign to attack you with the goal of getting you to agree to some global code of conduct. They're going to do it by targeting your upstream business, that is oil production. And they're going to target your downstream, where your ultimate consumers are, on and on and on. And then in one slide, Stratfor presents a table demonstrating that in every situation with activists, you're going to have a public demand and then a quote unquote real demand that you could actually settle for. For instance, a campaign against Victoria's Secret might involve the public demand 
that all products be made from recycled content. But hey, since that would destroy the business, the real demand might just be to switch to different production mills. Or a campaign against gold sourcing might have the public demand to end acquiring gold from environmentally destructive mines or to change sourcing. But the quote unquote real demand is really just to participate in IRMA, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. And for Suncor, they identify the public demand as an end to oil sands extraction, but the real demand as just adopting a code of conduct. This, this one I think was really uh, interesting for me to read because it goes on to mention that a code of conduct is extremely preferable to a company because it's not a regulation, something that they're bound to by law. It's just really a window dressing of whatever they're doing and they can stick to it or they don't have to. It doesn't matter. But the key was avoid at all costs any sort of regulation. And uh, they really drove that point home. And, and so they took all this, these ideas and they went even farther. They went on to identify how these groups will eventually form a concerted campaign against Suncor. And they, they go out and they identify all the targets that they're going to have and which organizations will spearhead these different parts. For example, uh, Forest Ethics will be putting pressure on ships not to purchase fuel from oil sands. The West Coast Environmental Law is going to try and use public fear of oil spills to get oil tankers blocked from the British Columbia coast. And... Then they go on even further, Daniel. <laughs> the intelligence agency outlines a bunch of different responses that Suncor could employ to ultimately defeat these efforts. Things like, quote unquote, rapid negotiations or maybe something called structured dialogue. Uh, there's one called flying in information, which involves Suncor creating their own environmental agenda and relying on positive press to hopefully drown out activist voices and make them lose credibility. And some of these really remind me of that original Nestle uh, situation where one of the major things Nestle found was really successful in turning the uh, people's outcry away from Nestle was they said that there was this uh, board called the International Regulatory Board of Baby Formula or some name like that, and that uh, ultimately approved the reformulation of Nestle's formula. What they neglected to mention was that the board was created by and controlled by Nestle. It was some organization they completely made up, made look like an actual thing, and then pointed to it to say, hey, look, this board says Nestle is good, so uh, you can definitely trust them, and therefore you can trust us that, that we're now the good guys. And a lot of these remind me of that kind of uh, parallel construction that's going on. Corporations can be creative. But my favorite uh, protocol that Stratfor presents as an option for Suncor is the simple no response. The rationale for a no response protocol is hey, the activists are not going to stop oil sands growth. They have no power in Alberta or Ottawa, and the chances of success with the US government is slim. The pro to a no response plan is that it reduces executive time and attention paid to this campaign, and no concessions are needed from the company. A con to this strategy is it does not resolve campaign and ensures long-term public campaign against oil sands operations. And then they have a best case and a worst case to this protocol. And the best case is that groups move to fracturing or some other venue to press for the first major code of contact, <laughs> which I think is really funny because they're basically saying, hey, if we just ignore the activists completely, don't say a word. Maybe they'll just get bored with us and they'll move on to the fracking industry and, and give them all their attention and leave us alone. <laughs> but then here's the worst case possibility to this approach. Quote, the activist campaign becomes the most significant environmental campaign of the decade as activists on both sides of the border come to view the industry as arrogant. Code of conduct demands strengthen, downstream activism intensifies. End quote. That, that seems like a hard choice for a company to make, David. Well, <laughs> oh no, the code of conduct demands are strengthening. What's going to happen? Yeah, either they'll leave us alone or we'll inadvertently create the most significant environmental movement in decades. Well, I guess that's kind of what's happened with the climate change situation where we'll just pretend this is not an issue. We'll just keep writing it off. We'll keep it buried for forever. And oh, whoops, now there's people shutting down bridges and everyone's a communist or socialist calling for the guillotining of my head. I think we might have might have whiffed this one, guys. Yeah. 
But why is it important to talk about corporate strategies for defeating activism? Today, we have these international movements building, coalitions of solidarity building momentum and strength. And I think we should keep at the forefront of our minds that there are very powerful institutions that will do everything they can to put a stop to that. And it's not going to be just coming down with the hammer. It's going to be flanking you. You know, you might be the first in line at a protest march and you look around, you see all the people shouting with you and you say, we're going to win this. But then what you don't realize is maybe a block down that company that you're protesting or that action you're doing is being countered by the fact that some executive sitting down with a nonprofit saying, look, those radicals out there, uh, they're causing trouble. They're a bad look. And if you align yourself with them, uh, you're going to lose donors. It's, it's going to be bad. Look, we will settle with you. We'll make some incremental change if you agree to it. And then it'll make you look good. You get to look like you did something. We'll get to continue on as usual. And um, everything will be fine. So keep that in mind. Are you building support? Are you building coalitions with other organizations and other groups? And are you really sticking to your original demands? And are you guarding against the isolation that is going to be uh, imposed on you? And can you recognize when you're being separated from your support group? That might be cause for alarm. I think knowing these mechanisms and knowing what to watch for is, is really important for anybody who's just starting to dip their toes into this world or even for seasoned activists. A lot of it's uh, don't have this media training, who don't have a PR perspective, and don't realize how they can and are being manipulated by these well-funded PR firms, advertising agencies, and corporations, and in many cases also intelligence agencies and law enforcement groups around the world. So, uh, so knowing what to look for, knowing what the uh, operating mechanism of these groups are, and knowing that you know some organizations are identified as basically pushovers, as realists, who are always going to give in. And know that if you are working or cooperating or donating or volunteering with these organizations, that you are doing so with the knowledge that a group like this is always going to be working within these systems, always going to be compromising with the people who are ultimately destroying the world. And I think that's important knowledge. And to know that at some point, those compromises are going to have to end. Uh, we're going to have to make demands that either need to be met or the system will collapse. And uh, there's no more room for compromise in that. So, so just something to keep in mind as you go forward. Um, since we are talking to activists throughout this episode and, and throughout the show especially, uh, know that there are people who are funded, who have paychecks, who have salaries, who only exist in their professional lives to tear down the things that you are pouring your passion, time, heart, soul, sweat, and blood into. And, and there's a lot of them. But what we have ultimately in the end of everything is the fact that we are on the right side. And uh, that will always give us the energy and that will always give us the, the people and the momentum to push us forward, even though that we oftentimes, almost always, have uh, not only uh, the world stacked against us and the way that things are right now, uh, not only the systems that we're fighting against, not only uh, these, these legal uh, tools, um, but also just the massive amounts of capital. It, it sounds bad, but change happens slowly and then all at once. And uh, I think we're, we're somewhere in that in-between stage. And uh, the next few years are going to be interesting. Do not compromise. Don't let your friends compromise. Well, that's a lot to think about. As always, Daniel. But think about it. We hope you will. You can find more information about everything we talked about today. You can find that PowerPoint. You can find links to WikiLeaks and other news stories on this mechanism of attacking activists or information on the upcoming Earth Strike and how you can be involved in your local community if you'd like to, as well as a full transcript of this show on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like us, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, discussing these issues amongst yourselves, or if you'd like to send a little financial love our way, uh, join us at patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. We'd like to thank our associate producers, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. Thank you so much.
Also, we have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. Send us your thoughts. We read them and we appreciate them. And even better than our email address is our call-in phone number. Uh, We love this thing and we love the messages we get from all of you. And if you are international and don't want to use this number, just send us a voice recording at our email. We'd love eventually to turn all of this into a call-in episode. And uh, we'll probably do that actually in the near future. So get those phone messages in while you still can. And the number to do that is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. And if you just want to continue consuming the amazing content that we put out here at Ashes Ashes, you can do that at any of your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast. Or if you want to be part of the conversation itself, you can come and join us on our Discord community. You can find the link to that on the website. Just click Community, Discord, and you'll find an invitation link there. Next week, we've got another deep dive episode on a topic that we think you will all find unexpected, but extremely interesting. And we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.